Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the colloquium uh, with our guest speaker, Alec Ag Agarwal, from Microsoft Research, New York. Alec studied at IIT Bombay and got his uh, master's, uh, his bachelor's degree in computer science. Then he went to Berkeley where he studied, he got a master's in statistics and a PhD in computer science, advised by uh, Peter Bartlett and Martin Wainwright. Um, and uh, since last year, he is a postdoc doctoral fellow at uh, Microsoft Research in New York City. Uh, and, uh, during this career, he amassed quite a list of awards, of which uh, I will list my favorites, which are uh, the participant uh, in the team of uh, India at uh, International Physics Olympiad, where he got a honorable mention. Then uh, a two-year Microsoft uh, PhD fellowship and a two-year Google PhD fellowship. And with this, I invite you to listen to Alex. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction, Marina. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been to Seattle many times and like the city a lot, so always good to find an excuse to visit. Uh, so. Um, I changed, some of you might have noticed I changed the title a little from the mouthful that was on the announcement. And efficient probably is something that most of us can wrap our heads around and hopefully automatic is something that will become clearer uh, as we go through the talk. So I want to begin by saying this is a pretty exciting time to be wor working in machine learning, mostly because uh, it's finding a pretty diverse set of applications uh, pretty much all over. So uh, some of the early adopters were uh, companies like uh, Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft, which uh, applied machine learning to tasks such as web search and ranking, uh, email spam detection, and so on. Uh, more recently, places like Amazon and Netflix have used machine learning in design of uh, uh, web scale recommender systems. Uh, medical imaging techniques have been benefiting from statistical techniques. A very nice example here is uh, pediatric MRIs uh, can reduce sensing times by using compressed sensing. Um, and many other applications arise, such as uh, large-scale genome-wide association studied uh, in computational biology, uh, like the use of optical character recognition uh, to scan checks, uh, or uh, you know, a lot of us talk to our phones these days, and this obviously uses automatic speech recognition and often translation. One thing I take a lot of heart from as a machine learning researcher is that, so the, all of these um, diverse applications and many more, of course, they have their own complexities and challenges, but there are also a lot of common elements to the design of a good solution to any of them. Uh, we might differ on the specific names that we associate with these, but I think the elements a lot of us will agree on. Uh, so the first step uh, is what I would call representation, where you start from some uh, diverse raw source of data like text or image or audio video signals and convert it into a form uh, intelligible to a machine learning algorithm. This process is often done by hand uh, but lately there's been increasing emphasis on uh, doing this automatically, also using learning techniques. Once you have a representation, the second step is what I would call modeling, where a lot of the statistical reasoning happens. So uh, uh, what kind of uh, mapping do we want to fit from inputs to outputs? Uh, what kind of goodness of fit measure or loss function do we want to use? Uh, do we want to in impose some structure on our estimates through the use of regularization methods and so on? And even after you've done the representation and modeling parts, you actually have to compute the solution. Uh, for the talk today, the computational step would be optimization. Uh, and of course, there is a choice of optimization techniques here. Uh, and the scale will often necessitate the use of distributed algorithms. Uh, so in my own research, I like to think about all these different aspects of designing solutions uh, to a machine learning problem. Uh, not just uh, independently, but also jointly understanding their trade-offs and interactions. Uh, of course, talking about all of them in one talk is not really practical, so what I'll do today instead is I'll focus on two specific things. Uh, the first half of the talk will be about a system we developed for distributed machine learning. This is uh, some work that started out of a summer internship I was doing at Yahoo Research. Uh, the second uh, part of my talk will be about the problem of uh, learning feature representations uh, in the context of dictionary learning. Uh, this work, uh, we we did over the summer, uh, over last summer with some interns uh, and uh, visitors at Microsoft Research. So starting with the first topic of uh, distributed machine learning, uh, so just to give some background, I, I've been working on the theory of distributed algorithms 
uh, sort of uh, pretty much throughout my PhD. And then uh, visiting Yahoo Research, I had, uh, I had a chance to actually implement some of these ideas at, uh, on a large scale system. And they had some good uh, application problems, like the computational advertising task shown here. So the goal here is you have a web page. A user vis visits the web page, and uh, they want to display an ad on the web page and want to predict whether the user will click the displayed ad or not, because uh, clicks kind of translate into money. Um, so you can do this uh, by looking at the past log data, but the logs are generated in real time, so they tend to be pretty huge. And even after do you do some sampling or something, you, you end up needing to use quite a few of them uh, to get good uh, accuracy in your prediction. So we ended up with about 17 billion examples in this case. And you also want to use as many parameters as possible uh, to get a good predictive model. So we, uh, we were fitting about 16 million parameters in this example. Uh, the reason I mentioned the numbers uh, is just to sort of give, give you an idea that uh, at this scale, uh, you, know, you, you can try to do everything on one machine, but it becomes really impractical, and you really want to use distributed algorithms. So the setup we had here, and in many uh, users of distributed machine learning, is that you have access to some kind of a computational cluster which you can think of as uh, a network of communicating nodes. Uh, so each uh, node here is a computer, and each uh, uh, link is a network connection. Now, the data you want is stored in some kind of a distributed file system. So each node in this cluster possesses only a subset of the data, like a subset of the logs from my previous example. What you want to do is you want to fit a model over this entire distributed data set uh, which no one node can do in isolation, right? So for instance, in this click prediction example, the data consists of um, some representation xi of the user ad web page triple. Uh, you want to predict whether there's going to be click or not. And you have some vector of parameters that you're trying to fit by minimizing some kind of a loss function. And crucially, this loss is accumulated over the entire data spread over a cluster. Uh, now, this is, of course, not a new problem. There have been many, uh, many approaches uh, people have proposed over the years to solve this. And um, it's very easy for things to go wrong at several points when you're trying to design such a system. Uh, so very common uh, uh, failure mode is uh, you design an algorithm while thinking about just the communication complexity or just the computational complexity. And when you actually try to use it, then it chokes because it has a poor performance on the other aspect. Uh, another common mistake is we, it's tempting to take a specific algorithm and try to parallelize it, right? Uh, now, machine learning is a moving field. So often, you parallelize an algorithm, and then somebody comes up with a better algorithm two years down the line, and now your parallelization is not relevant anymore. So what we would like to do is we would like to parallelize broad classes of algorithms so that our effort uh, kind of uh, stays relevant over some time. Um, even when we get these th things right, uh, one problem often happens, which is uh, the machine learning method can run in a certain distributed environment, but the large data sets are being stored in some other kind of distributed data store, such as a MapReduce cluster, for instance. And so if your algorithm does not play well with that infrastructure, you cannot run on the large data sets. And finally, uh, one thing you want to avoid is you don't want to end up with a distributed algorithm that looks completely different from the serial algorithm that you started with. Because that, that would mean you say goodbye to all the serial machine learning code you've written, and you rewrite everything from scratch, which is uh, practically a very painful thing to be doing. So uh, in, in the first half of the talk today, I'll give you one example of how we came up with a system that circumvents all these uh, troubles. And of course, there are uh, other ways that are also possible to address these issues. So recall we are uh, trying to solve this sort of an optimization problem over, uh, over a distributed data set. And there are two dominant classes of uh, techniques people use to solve these problems, uh, so-called stochastic methods, uh, of which an example is stochastic gradient descent. I'm not going to assume familiarity with what that means, uh, and it will not be necessary for the talk. The second uh, class is so-called batch optimization. An example of this is gradient descent or uh, fancier variants. Uh, let's, let's start by uh, seeing what, the, what, what e each of these sort of roughly look like in spirit. So one way people have tried to do distributed stochastic optimization is the following. So you have 
uh, you have a bunch of nodes, each with, each with its local data set. Each node starts running the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, whatever it is, again, we don't need to know, uh, over its own local data set. So it, it goes, goes over its example, ends up with a solution W1 that looks good on its local data set. Similarly, the second node ends up with a solution W2, uh, and, and so on. Uh, now you take all these different solutions and you average them together. And sometimes this average already ends up being uh, a pretty good solution for the entire distributed data set. Sometimes it doesn't. And in that case, what you do is you take this average and you plug it back in up top and you start computing stochastic gradients all over again at each node, get to the bottom, average again, and repeat this whole, this whole process many, many times. Right, so this is roughly what uh, distributed stochastic gradient descent might look like. The other uh, approach, like I said, is uh, distributed batch optimization. So here, the intuition is uh, we're trying to minimize a function f that looks like sum of losses. Uh, so one, way, one sort of general idea whenever you're trying to minimize a function is you start from some point and uh, run an iterative algorithm where at each uh, each uh, solution WT, um, you find the current direction where the function is decreasing rapidly, which is the negative gradient direction, and you take a small step in that direction to obtain the next uh, candidate solution. So doing that, you sort of hill climb down this surface and eventually hope to reach the bottom of the function. Uh, now in particular, when your function looks like sum of losses over data points, the gradient looks like sum of gradients over data points. And when your data is spread over a cluster, this sum further breaks up into sum over examples that are local to a given node j. So this part of the sum can be computed uh, locally by the node itself without any communication. And then there is an outer sum over all the nodes for which you need some communication to accumulate the local gradients across nodes. Right? So pictorially, this looks something like this that each machine is now running a local gradient computation, ends up with a gradient vector g1, g2 up to gk. Uh, you sum these local gradients and take a step in the negative gradient direction to obtain the next iterate. You plug the iterate back up, start computing the gradients again, and repeat the process. Now, both these approaches have their own strengths and weaknesses. So here I'm plotting the, uh, so, so they're both theoretically reasonably well understood, and I'm plotting what the theory would predict the optimization error should look like as we make more and more passes over our data. So the first thing we see is that the error initially of the blue stochastic curve drops much faster, while the red one is not even on the chart for batch. Right? So initially, stochastic is great, but once the red one gets to a good point, its error drops much faster and eventually overtakes uh, stochastic. So the, the, the first time I uh, saw this plot, it, it kind of felt like there's chance for a beautiful synergy here by, taking, uh, by combining the two approaches. And really what we would like to do is take the best of both the worlds. Right? Uh, so this is what we call the hybrid approach, where initially you start out stochastic and then you switch over to batch and you ideally want to lie on the black curve. Uh, what this uh, looks like in our in, in terms of our previous schematics would be so you start by running stochastic over each node locally like before, obtain the local weights w1 through wk, compute their average. Now you disseminate this average back to the back to the nodes. Start local gradient computation. So this is the batch part. Obtain the local gradients. Take a step in the negative gradient direction. And now we're going to repeat just the second phase. So we're going to take this uh, updated solution, plug it back into just the local batch gradient computation, and repeat the second phase many, many times. You, you, of course, you don't need to do the top phase all, just once. You can do it a few times also. And some variations are possible there. But this is sort of the rough idea. Right, so we start stochastic and then switch over to batch. Turns out this hybrid approach can have some value. So 
uh, we were able to prove that the hybrid approach can reduce computation by a factor of up to two. Um, and in these environments, it might mean a running time of half an hour versus running time of an hour. So you really do care about that factor of two. And while, uh, while that's just a theoretical prediction, it does manifest, the gain manifests also in practice. So here I'm showing optimization error versus number of passes over data. For the dotted line without hybrid and the solid line with hybrid, and so you see the hybrid method is consistently doing better distributed algorithm, which is quite nice. So the question is, uh, is the gain by a factor of two relative to batch alone? And uh, actually, you can prove it's up to a factor of two relative to the best of uh, batch and stochastic. It, it seems like, yeah, because I mean, all the plots seem to be as a function of iteration, but of course, stochastic steps can be much more efficient than batch steps. So how is that going to into play? Um, so, uh, okay, so uh, you can, you can count everything in number of, uh, the, 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 how your error drops in terms of number of passes over data. And uh, even in stochastic, because, uh, okay, so, so for stochastic, I'm looking at this particular way of doing stochastic, j just repeated averaging. And in, in that, we can easily count the convergence in terms of number of passes over data. Uh, and the reason the stochastic does not necessarily uh, do better than hybrid is because you're doing stochastic individually at nodes, so you still have only a suboptimal solution at other nodes data sets. So uh, you need many, many rounds of averaging, in fact, often for this to work. Okay. Now, the distributed algorithms I've described so far are sort of still cartoon distributed algorithms because I haven't really told you. There, there are all these things I assume, like we can average local weights in stochastic, we can average, we can add local gradients in batch, and it's very natural to ask, well, how the hell do we actually do that? How, how do we sum these quantities over a network? Well, what is the primitive? Yes? Uh, question is, uh, was the theoretical factor of two in the convex case? And that's uh, absolutely right, yeah. Okay, so turns out for communication, there is an abstraction which has precisely the characteristics we want, right? So there, this is a standard abstraction in parallel computing called all reduce, where the initial state is each node starts out with a number or a vector of numbers, and each node ends up with the sum of all the numbers. So in terms of this abstraction, then, if you applied all reduce to local weights or local gradients, you would, in fact, achieve the effect you wanted. And one way you can think about uh, doing such an operation is the following. So you put a tree structure over all the nodes in your network. Each node has a local number. Now we're going to communicate these numbers, up the, the local numbers up the tree. So for instance, uh, here we should end up with the sum of 4, 5, and 2 once we are done communicating. And so we get 11. Similarly, we get 16 here. And then that's communicated further up. And now the root has the sum of all the numbers. And once the root has it, it can communicate these numbers back down, and now everybody has the entire sum. You can. So you're still communicating parameter vectors, right? So if I have a, a very large model of a billion parameters, are you going to send seven, you know, tens of gigabytes round for each gradient step like this? So yeah, the question is, uh, what what exactly am I communicating? And I am still communicating parameters. Uh, so uh, absolutely, if you're parameter vector gets to the point where, um, where you have uh, that kind of uh, number of parameters, then uh, you do want to think about sort of uh, distributed parameter representations like parameter server or something. Right, so conceptually, so far in terms of all reduce now, we can express our algorithms a bit more concretely. So the weight averaging step can be written as just doing an all reduce on local weights uh, divided by the number of nodes. And the gra distributed gradient step is, again, in terms of all reduce, just apply to the local gradients. One thing I want to point out here is, uh, just like in, in this picture, we can obtain a real distributed algorithm just by using two calls to all reduce. Often, that's going to be the extent of also the code mod modification we need to go to go from a serial to distributed algorithm, which is quite nice. Okay, now uh, this is uh, the nice thing is that all reduced by is not just a theoretical abstraction. It in fact exists in one of the earliest parallel learning framework, uh, parallel uh, computation frameworks, 
called MPI. Uh, but that's where we hit a bit of a snag. So um, large data sets are typically not stored in MPI clusters. Um, probably the most uh, common situation is they are stored in some sort of a map reduced, such as a Hadoop cluster. Um, and there's a variety of good reasons for it. Hadoop provide, uh, MapReduce provides some nice functionalities like uh, fault tolerance, speculative execution for dealing with straggler nodes, uh, data local computation, which minimizes uh, network communication, and so on. And so we would like to use sort of the convenience of all reduce, but that's not where our data is. So a natural solution uh, we, we tried was to just develop a Hadoop-compatible implementation of all reduce. So this was uh, mostly uh, an engineering uh, part of uh, part of the job, but uh, one that had be, to be done carefully in order to make sure the, the latency and bandwidth are sort of in control. Uh, the nice thing is once you do this, you end up with a robust system with fairly fast communication. Robustness mostly comes from the MapReduce part and uh, fast communication due to all reduce. Right? And it is indeed really fast. So here's a comparison of trying to do distributed machine learning using vanilla MapReduce versus our Hadoop compatible version of uh, all reduce. Um, so the blue blue is for all reduce, red is for map reduce, and this is for two different sizes of data. And this is a time for one iteration, right? So if you imagine doing this uh, 10 or 15 times, you don't want to be facing the red running time. You would like to have the blue running time here. And this is just because uh, doing mach doing distributed machine learning in the vanilla map reduce framework has certain overheads we, we are able to avoid. Uh, overall, you can reason about the properties of the system. So what you end up with is pretty balanced communication and computational complexities. This you can easily achieve by modulating sort of the, the, the number of data points per nodes and the number of nodes and so on. The system is pretty iteration friendly because uh, you can, once you have the all reduced topology set up, you can communicate as many times as you want. And this iteration is, uh, for those of you who are familiar, is probably the primary thing that's awkward in a vanilla map reduced system. Uh, it is, though, Hadoop compatible, so it allows us to run on the large data sets stored in MapReduce clusters. And the nice thing I like about it is often just with two to three lines of code modification, we are able to take a serial algorithm and t er, turn it into a parallel one, which is quite powerful. Okay, so I want to show you some empirical evaluation for the system. So I already told you a little about the display advertising data set. Another data set we uh, tried things on is uh, computational biology data set for a task of predicting human acceptor splice sites from DNA snippets, uh, which had about 50 million examples, with each example about 11 million dimensional. So the first thing you want to check for any parallel learning system is what its speed up looks like as you add more and more nodes to the system. Uh, here I'm showing the speed up curve for the display advertising task as we go from 10 to 100 nodes. Uh, the dotted line shows the ideal linear speed up, and while we are not there, uh, it's not bad. And it doesn't stop, the speed up doesn't stop at 100, uh, so we've, we've scaled the system to 1,000 nodes pretty easily without having much troubles. Uh, we can evaluate it also with respect to some other methods. So here I'm showing uh, the, the predictive accuracy of our model on the uh, splice site recognition task. As we make more and more passes over the data, uh, so this is accuracy, so higher is better. Um, and uh, we are showing results compared to uh, another approach that was developed within Yahoo Research and an algorithm developed at Microsoft Research. So as we see, we are definitely getting better accuracy. And this is still in, in number, uh, terms of number of passes over data. So what we are not penalizing the other methods for here is uh, that they often have more communication complexities, which translates to uh, an even higher wall clock time than what this indicates. And another remark I want to make is some of the uh, other approaches that have been developed over the years, uh, when we tried to run them, they, they didn't even fall on this curve. Uh, they were totally prohibitive in communication or computation. Uh, the, the implementation we did is available in an open source uh, machine learning software called Vopal Wobbit, which is uh, uh, at this point being used uh, in several different uh, industrial settings. Uh, I, I can definitely tell uh, uh, about Microsoft. From my experience there, uh, it's being adopted, both sort of the system itself as well as 
the, the algorithmic and communication components of it have, have now been combined with other machine learning systems as well. Um, and uh, I, I do want to qualify this, though, by saying that uh, when designing the system, we were really uh, focusing on the, the sort of usual kinds of linear classification, regression type of tasks that we are often working with in machine learning, where I think the system does really well. There are, of course, other kinds of machine learning problems as well. And depending on the particular problem, something else might be uh, more suited, like you know, Carlos's graph lab uh, type approaches or Steve Boyd's ADMM type approaches and so on. Um, OK, so one thing I really like about uh, this entire system, though, is we were able to start from some nice theoretical insights about sort of the optimization properties of this hybrid method and so on. And uh, with some careful engineering, we were able to uh, come up with an overall effective system. Now, sometimes you for face the opposite problem. You have something. It works really well in practice, and you have absolutely no idea why. And that's, in fact, going to be the theme of the second part of the talk, when I consider this problem of dictionary learning. Let me start by giving my motivation for how I ended up at this problem. So um, motivation comes from the fact that when we're doing machine learning, our data takes many diverse forms. Sometimes it's text documents, images. Sometimes it's audio video signals. And when we design our algorithms or write our papers, it's often very convenient uh, to think of our data sort of as this neat matrix of numbers uh, where each row represents a data sample, and uh, each data sample is just a vector of numbers. So of course, uh, you ask what these numbers are, what they mean, where they come from, and the answer is of most often they are hand-coded. Um, and this process of feature engineering can take considerable amount of time and skill, but is typically pretty crucial to good performance of a machine learning system. So a natural question to ask is, well, can't we just learn these good feature uh, representations from data uh, uh, rather than doing this by hand, especially if we have access to larger and larger data sets? A different motivation comes from the field of actually uh, signal processing, in particular from a compression uh, point of view. So we all know that um, high dimensional signals like high resolution images or high resolution movies are expensive to store. Of course, if you have a sparse high dimensional signal, it's pretty easy to store. You just store the non-zero values and where they occur. Uh, but sparsity is a feature of representation. Uh, so an image, for instance, may not look sparse in the pixel representation, but could be sparse in a different representation. So you might ask, well, can't we just learn a representation where signals of interest look sparse so that we can compress them effectively or do something else like compress sensing on them effectively? Right. And in practice, the answer often turns out to be yes. So here I'm showing an example from a paper of Brookstein and co-authors uh, from 2009. Uh, but, but this sort of uh, result just go uh, much further back. So the task here they took was, we have a database of facial images that we would like to compress. Uh, we can do this using a standard algorithm like JPEG or discrete cosine transform or something. Or we could try to learn a dictionary over these faces a representation where these faces are sparse, and then use that to compress. Uh, now, when you do that, you end up with uh, this compression, which arguably here is the best reconstruction of the original image. Right, so this does work in practice. Uh, and the nice thing is this is not just a one-off. The, these results have been consistently uh, re repeated in many, for instance, image processing problems like denoising in painting super resolution and so on. But most of the methods that uh, do this uh, dictionary learning rely on certain non-convex optimization problems. So it's, it's very hard to explain uh, their uh, success uh, in theory. And so there's been sort of a relatively wide gap between the state of theory and practice on this problem. So uh, now let me define the problem a bit more formally before uh, telling you about the solution. Uh, so the intuition behind dictionary learning is that you have an example like a facial image, you want to express it as a sum of uh, some dictionary elements. Uh, for instance, for a face, you might try to view something like a, it is a sum of eyes plus nose plus mouth. Maybe you, you add a couple of ears here. You, know, you, you get the basic idea. Right? Uh, of course, you have a different face that might have a different pair of eyes, nose, and mouth. 
And in general, you might have a database of faces, and you'll have a whole collection of these dictionary elements. And now you will encode the data using a coefficient matrix, uh, which for each data point, right? So for each face, there's going to be a column in this coefficient matrix that indicates by its non-zero entries, which is the pair of eyes that are used in this face, which is the nose and which is the mouth that is used in, in this face. Right? So what we are doing is we are taking our faces, which were originally repre represented as pixel values, and encoding them using this dictionary. Uh, let me clarify. This is just a cartoon example. This is not how you would actually approach this problem. You would probably do it over image patches rather than uh, doing it in this way mostly. Uh, but one thing I do want to point out here is that uh, suggestively the coefficient matrix looks sparse because we are after sparse representations for compression uh, or signal processing uh, uh, reasons, for instance. So a bit more formally, we'll think of our uh, uh, examples as a, a matrix where we have one column. So we have n examples, and we have uh, one column per example, and each column is a d-dimensional vector like a vector of pixel values for a face. Uh, we want to break this up into dictionary, which has R dictionary elements, uh, times a coefficient matrix. And this coefficient matrix will encode which are the dictionary elements in each example. And we would like this coefficient matrix to be sparse. Now, I motivated this using faces. You can think about this in many ways. You can think of this as a topic model, where examples are text documents. Uh, dictionary elements are something like uh, um, business, news, uh, politics, and so on. Uh, and you're, you're positing that no document has too many topics. You can think of this as an overlapping clustering model, where uh, the dictionary elements are cluster centers, and uh, you want no point to belong in too many clusters, and so on. Um, a note about the setting. We are interested in the overcomplete setting here, which basically means that this matrix A star can be quite wide. So we, we would like to allow the, the number of dictionary elements to be fairly large, although uh, how many we can learn will be constrained by how much data we have, of course. And this will become clearer. So now I've told you about the setting. Let me tell you about how people usually approach this problem in practice. So most, most of the methods people have looked at uh, boil down to some variant of this idea or the other um, that we've, we would like to factorize this data matrix y as dictionary times coefficients. And we want the coefficient matrix to be sparse. And a good way of enforcing sparsity is by minimizing the sum of absolute values, the, sum of the L1 norm of the matrix x. If you don't know this already, there is no, no need to worry about why this is a good surrogate for sparsity. Uh, just take my word for it. Right, so most of the practical approaches, they start from some initial guess of the dictionary. This can be random. This can be uh, chosen using a heuristic and so on. And now you first fix the dictionary A, and you say, well, for this dictionary, what is a good set of coefficients to reconstruct my data such that the coefficients are sparse? So uh, this is usually called a sparse regression problem. There are many good solvers available for solving this uh, efficiently. Uh, then you obtain the coefficients, and you say, well, given these coefficients, what is a good dictionary? And this is now just a system of linear equations that you can solve using least squares, for instance. And now you can just iterate between these two steps where you find an updated coefficient, set of coefficients given a new dictionary and an updated dictionary given the new coefficients. And you repeat this process for a while. Right? Uh, so this might look familiar to some of you, uh, similar to the EM algorithm for solving this problem, or like k-means, in fact, where Sparse regression is like assigning each point to the closest center, and uh, least squares is like designing centers by averaging data points. And just like EM or k-means, this algorithm in general will not converge to the global optimum from an, from an arbitrary initialization. Let's see a little more why, why that's the case. Um, so recall the optimization problem underlying this method is uh, minimizing L1 norm of coefficient matrix subject to y equals ax. And note that both a and x are optimization variables over here. Now, this turns out to be a non-convex constraint, because average of two solutions is not a solution. So the simplest way to see is if y is equal to a times x, then y is, of course, equals to mi minus a times minus x. 
What y is not equal to is the average of these two dictionaries times average of these two coefficients. That gives you 0. Right? And this cannot happen in a convex problem. Average of feasible solutions is a feasible solution. So this problem is definitely not convex. And so it's, uh, def we are going to need uh, some further structure if we want to able to solve this problem to the global optimality. Right? And this non-convexity essentially has precluded largely theory from being developed for this problem. I think the most notable exception was uh, Spielman and co-authors in 2002 came up. They, they decided to leave the alternating minimization approach and came up instead with a linear programming algorithm to solve the problem in the under complete setting where the dictionary is not too large. Um, now, this was quite a remarkable result. What I was un unhappy about was that they had to leave the alternating minimization solution, which seemed so uh, effective when you actually run it. So what we did instead was we took the alternating minimization approach, but combined it with a novel initialization scheme. And as a result, we were able to show that under some assumptions, uh, this gives us the global optimal, uh, optimum of the problem despite non-convexity in the overcomplete setting. OK, so let me tell you a bit about our main idea for initialization approach. Right? I, all, we already went a bit over the alternating minimization, so now we are looking at the initialization part. And the key idea here was the following. So we are given the example matrix Y. Let's try to find a subset of columns, so a subset of examples in the, uh, in the matrix Y, which all have non-zero coefficients on a particular dictionary element, like the red one in this example. So you can take this matrix. Now what you can show is that if you actually uh, plot these data points uh, on a plot, then they look roughly like this plot shown here, where they have a dominant component in this red direction. So mathematically, what this means is that if you take the green matrix and do PCA on it, then the top singular vector will, have a, will be well aligned in the red direction, and you can use that top singular vector to estimate the red direction. That is, if we could find this green matrix to begin with. right? So, so we, we still have to tell, us, uh, tell you how to find it. And our approach for, uh, for doing that was based on looking at correlations between data points. So the idea was, well, if two data points have uh, both non-zero coefficients on a common dictionary element, then they should have some sizable correlation with each other. So what we did was we formed a graph where each node stood for an example. And you put an edge between two examples if the magnitude of correlation between them is large. Right, so you, this way you obtain an entire graph. Now, suppose you find large cliques or approximate cliques in this graph. So what, what does that tell us? So we know that what each edge tells us these, th these two things have a common dictionary element, right? That we're taking on good faith because I said so, of course. And now, if you take the entire clique, so each, pa each pa pair of things here have a common dictionary element, in fact, you can show with some reasoning that with high probability, it is the same dictionary element common to all of them. So everything in this blue clique will have, say, the dictionary element 1 in it. This, this takes a proof, so it's, it's not obvious. Similarly, everything in the red clique with high probability will contain the same dictionary element, say, dictionary element 2. So what these cliques are providing us, they are providing us exactly this uh, submatrix of examples I was looking for on the previous slide. OK, so now we've got to find these approximate cliques. Here is a simple idea. We start with an edge, like the green one. We find every node that has, end point, that has edges to this endpoint as well as this endpoint of the edge, and that gives us the blue clique in a, in a natural way. Unweighted. Of course, things might not go so well. You might pick the magenta edge over here. And now when you look at the common neighborhood, you end up with the union of the red and the blue clique. And this is not good because half of the elements, half of the data points contain dictionary element one, other half contain two. Right? So you don't want to be in this case. But of course, uh, I mean, a, union, a clique versus a union of two cliques looks visually very different, right? So you can, you can easily test just by counting number of edges in the common neighborhood whether an edge is sort of in the green case or the magenta case. 
so I'm not going to go into the specifics of the exact way we test that, but it's just counting number of edges. So overall, the initialization algorithm now looks like the following. We first construct a correlation graph. Then for each edge, we first test whether the edge is good. If it is good, we take all the common neighbors of the endpoints of the edge, form their uh, sample covariance, and do an, uh, take the top singular vector of the sample covariance. And we declare that to be an estimate of uh, some dictionary element. Right? And, and that's the algorithm. I want to remark that a uh, similar approach was also developed simultaneously and independently uh, by Sanjeev Arora's group at Princeton for initialization uh, with, of course, uh, some differences in the, in the theory and specifics. Okay, so now I would like to present some results about this overall procedure for which I need some assumptions, of course. Uh, so one uh, main assumption we make is that the dictionary satisfies what's called a coher incoherence condition, which is quite common in this literature, means that if you take two different dictionary elements, they are approximately orthogonal. This would be satisfied, for instance, by a random matrix uh, with the right properties. Uh, the other assumption we make on the coefficient matrix is that coefficient matrix is sparse. And for now, let's assume that the sparsity pattern is random, although that part can be relaxed. Uh, so the main result is if you have these two assumptions, and you're given at least order r squared examples where r is the number of dictionary elements that you're looking for. And now you take the graph clustering algorithm that I just described and use it to initialize the earlier alternating minimization procedure. Then with high probability, good things happen. So if you measure your error to the dictionary A star, uh, then each step of alternating minimization will halve that error. And so if you run enough steps of alternating minimization, you can get arbitrarily close to the true dictionary. And so we can declare exact recovery of the true dictionary from order r squared samples. And the key uh, sort of, uh, the, the key thing here is that we, we use the fact that we have been initialized in the right way. So the novel initialization allows us to recover the global optimum of the problem. Right? And the key uh, sort of, uh, element in establishing this result is that using the initialization step, we can already get a crude idea of what the real dictionary looks like. And um, once you take this crude estimate, this falls in what you would call a basin of attraction of the correct dictionary, so that from there, when you run alternating minimization, it discovers the right dictionary, the global optimum. So this behavior is often called local linear convergence in optimization parlance. I gave you some intuition about the initialization already. Let me lead you a little bit through um, the, the, the proof of the alternating minimization part. So ideally, we, what we want in alternating minimization is we start with some initial dictionary. We have the global optimum that we are trying to approach. And we want, when we estimate the coefficients, we get closer to the true solution. When we refit our dictionary, we get even closer to the real dictionary, and so on. We make progress in each step is what we want. Now, things might not be so good, and you could, in principle, look, here we are not working with the true dictionary, right? We are trying to fit coefficients with an estimate of the dictionary, and in principle, nothing prevents you from ending up with a set of coefficients that is wildly inaccurate, right? So you could actually uh, not make progress in some steps, or even lose progress in some steps, and you, you need to rule this out. And that's where sort of uh, one of our key lemmas comes in. And uh, so, so this result says that suppose you start with a coefficient matrix that is a good estimate, about one over s accurate estimate of the true coefficient matrix. And then if you use this to estimate the dictionary, then the error in the dictionary will be bounded by this factor s squared over root d times the error in the coefficients. So if s squared is suitably small relative to root d, then your error in coefficients is going to be suitably smaller than error in coefficients. And furthermore, you can, in fact, relate this error in coefficients uh, all the way back to error in dictionary from the previous step, because that's what you used to fit the coefficients. Right? So th these are very much like perturbation theory arguments, except the standard perturbation theory results 
turn out to be horribly loose here, so you cannot get a contraction using them. So you have to actually do a fair bit of uh, uh, additional work in order to establish them, but they are, in a sense, perturbation arguments. And the other thing I want to uh, emphasize here is that this part, this suppose part, highlights the importance of the initialization, because it is the initial solution that allows us to uh, enable this precondition. So, the, so our initialization ensures that we can discover coefficients that are uh, this accurate. So uh, you're saying that the, the dictionary will converge to this A star I. Right. Um, so, so each, each, yeah, each, each dictionary. Element. Each element, right? So, so uh, that means that it does implies the assumption of uh, an existence of uh, A star I. Oh, yeah, so I'm assuming that the data is indeed generating, uh, generated according to this dictionary model. It's not overcomplete itself. Uh, no, this, this is an overcomplete dictionary. So, so R here, the number of dictionary elements in the true dictionary, can be substantially larger than the dimensionality of the data that you observe, right? So, so the, the input data that you observe is in D dimensions. Uh, you're trying to find a dictionary that is in potentially much higher dimensions. But each dictionary element itself is d-dimensional. from doing linear combinations of the existing dictionary, so rotating basically my dictionary. That's, that's actually a very good question. So if you rotate things, then in general, you will not necessarily end up with a sparse reconstruction of the data points. So it's the sparsity constraint on the coefficient matrix that keeps you from going to rotations. Right, because you, you can always try to, yeah, you can put a, put a rotation and you can put an inverse of the rotation transformation on the coefficients, but now the coefficients don't end up looking sparse necessarily. So you have to have to assume more than, so it can, it's not enough to assume the coefficients are sparse, but you have to assume that the sparsity doesn't have a particular pattern. So for example, if everybody yes, has so, uh, the same elements that you Yes, so, so again, that's, uh, so you can allow for, for those kinds of uh, sparsity patterns, but then the nature of guarantees has to change. So, because what happens is, for instance, if, uh, so, okay, if two dictionary elements tend to sort of co-occur very frequently, that's a, that's a really pathological case. That I don't think I know how to handle very well yet. But for, for instance, if different dictionary elements have different occurrence uh, frequencies, that you can deal with uh, easily. So, you know, if you have sort of a head and tail type of behavior, you can deal with that. Uh, Marina had a question. I wanted to ask if this transfers to noisy measurements or to uh, you know, compressible yeah. measurements and all that. So yeah, the question was, does this translate to noisy measurements? So uh, the answer is a partial yes. Um, so if you have deterministic noise in the measurements, you can show that the uh, you find a reconstruction, which is uh, your, the dictionary you get has an error that's bounded by the L2 infinity norm of the noise matrix, so the maximum column L2 norm. Uh, now this this is uh, this is also the best you can hope to get for a deterministic noise matrix, but you hope to actually do better for a stochastic noise matrix. Um, there we currently have some troubles, and the trouble basically it's common actually to all the analyses that have been done for alternating minimization to my uh, knowledge that you start with a stochastic noise, you do a step of alternating minimization, but now that you you have already est your estimates have become correlated with the noise. So now it's very hard to reason why this should act not like deterministic noise. And so that's something we are looking with. I mean, sort of a usual um, theorist argument here is to say, oh, I'm just going to appeal to having fresh, fresh samples at each alternating minimization step, and we don't want to do that. So, so we're still working on that aspect. So I want to start wrapping up by reminding you, we talked about two things today. The first uh, part of the talk was doing efficient machine learning through uh, distributed uh, algorithms. The second part of the talk was uh, sort of uh, tr trying to uh, learn or discover improved feature representations uh, when you start from some base representation for diverse forms of data. And hopefully, this can allow us to use machine learning algorithms in a more automatic manner. So this was uh, the, the sort of second, second keyword. Um, one thing I think I like about, uh, th I think both these, uh, bo both these works share is that uh, we we obtain some theoretical insights uh, that naturally lead into practical algorithms. And this is something I like to sort of obtain more broadly in my uh, research as well. 
and which naturally leads into several other directions that I have not talked to you about today, but some of which I would like to mention briefly. Um, one thing I like to do, uh, and I found very fruitful, is rather than considering sort of the computational and statistical aspects of our uh, machine learning problems in isolation, want to look at them jointly and understand the interactions and trade-offs, right? So uh, I don't necessarily want to think what is the minimum amount of data to, needed to solve a statistical problem, but I would like to understand what is the minimum amount of data and computation needed to solve a statistical problem well. Right. Now, a special uh, case of interest that I've looked at also a fair bit that arises uh, is so in high dimensional statistics, we are interested in these structured problems where the parameter of interest is a low rank matrix or a sparse vector or something. And um, there's very nice theory about uh, how we can do this. And the, and the estimators we are often looking at end up being some convex optimization problems in high dimensions again. And the computation of these things also scales poorly with the dimension in general. So uh, you, you, you naturally ask, well, if you can save, save in the statistical complexity by using these low rank or sparsity assumptions, can you also save something in computation? So in many cases, the answer turns out to be yes, and um, involves combining elements of both high dimensional statistics and convex optimization, and leads to sort of a very uh, uh, fruitful area of research. So both of these uh, directions, sort of the more abstract notion of trade-offs and specific uh, application to high dimensional statistics are things that I have uh, looked a fair bit in my past research, uh, and I plan to continue exploring these directions in future work. But there are also some new directions that I've been more recently fairly excited about and working on. So, so one problem that repeatedly arises in many settings is you're in an interactive setting. So uh, let's say you're a search engine, um, a user issues a query, and uh, you give a search, set of search results and get some feedback in terms of click or no click feedback. And then you would like to incorporate this feedback to improve your system. You have to be careful here because there are certain causal feedback loops when you're trying to use the gathered data to improve the performance of the system. And you can make some conclusions that are not sound if you don't do this the right way. So there are questions of exploration versus exploitation that arise when you're trying to answer such uh, questions that I've been looking at a fair bit. In fact, we just obtained a, a very nice result here that was uh, posted to archive, I think, last week uh, that I'm quite excited about uh, this uh, and more generally about this whole direction. Uh, so, I mean, this is, of course, not just applicable for online systems, but uh, the, the applications range from, for instance, any kind of personalization of interfaces to even personalized medicine and so on. Uh, the other, uh, and this was already kind of the theme of the dictionary lear learning part of my work, but more generally, there are many of these non-convex optimization problems that naturally arise in machine learning that are solved very successfully in practice. Uh, but for which we, we sort of, uh, our computational understanding is still uh, relatively poor. So neural networks are one of the prime examples of uh, such, a, such a problem. And I've been looking at some questions in this direction, and uh, I think this is going to be a very active area of research in the coming years, and one uh, that I definitely plan to be a part of. I would like to remark, you, you might have already noticed from you know, the, the works I talk about that um, I like to work uh, in a collaborative way, and I know that there are people uh, here, both in the stat stats and CS department, who are interested in various aspects of these problems, and if I were to be here, I would definitely look forward to collaborating with people on many of these topics. So that's all I have to say. Thanks a lot for your attention. test about the advertising. As a computer vision person, the only way I can imagine 16 million parameters if it's, is that it's the image itself. What are the 16 million parameters? Okay, that's a great question. That what were these 16 million parameters in my, uh, in my da data set, right? So, so actually 16 million is after we did some dimensionality reduction through hashing and whatnot. So, so this, is, this is a very natural scenario whenever you have so just, just think of uh, vocabulary-based data to begin with, right? Vocabulary is huge. Even though each uh, individual document might contain only a few words, 
the entire vocabulary is big. Uh, but now, in my setting, I had uh, the, the, the text data on the, on the web page, the text and a uh, variety of other advertiser-based features on the ad itself, and then some information about the user, like their user login, maybe their uh, demographic information, and so on. And further, you often don't just look at just the words in the query and the ad alone, uh, sorry, ad and web page alone. You like to take combinations, or did this word co-occur? So you're taking products, uh, so that can be easily word vocabulary squared. So you know, just uh, you, are, you end up with very large number of features, very small number of which will occur in any given example, though. And uh, so, so, in fact, we had hashed these examples down to a lower dimension. So, uh, so in your dictionary learning uh, algorithm, you mentioned that the iterates have a trade-off between the coefficient and the uh, dictionary. Because it seems like you can't, get, you can't start with an error that's less than 1 over square root d to have an improvement in a, because it's like 1 over s versus s square over d. Um, sorry, uh, are you? Yeah. You're talking about this? Yeah. So uh, it seems like your error in the coefficient cannot go below 1 over square root d based on this level. No, because, see, this is just saying the error in the coefficients is at least 1 over s. So it can be much smaller. And if it, right? So if it's much smaller, the, I, all I want is this factor to be smaller than 1. If there are no more questions, let us thank, uh, thank Alec again.